that's out. I'm using you as an example, if you don't mind. So now I'm down to just three instead of five, and then that numbness space thing, yeah, yeah, probably I'm gonna put that one on the back. So now I'm down to two and a half. See what I mean? You're whittling it down. And the best example I can give is a 37-year-old musician in Denver. Excellent. Type one pain, shooting, perfect MVD candidate. Until we told him the 0.86% hearing loss because the face pain was on the side that he does his violin, and he said, can't do it, doc. Can't take that risk. So he's gone glycerol, glycerol, glycerol. He's now had glycerol seven times over 20 years. But he's happy as a clam. Works every time. A little more than I would have liked, but. Glycerol is still available. Yeah, for sure. But the point is, he chose, even though I was telling him this has the best durability, the least chance you'll, you'll have to come back to us, and so on. Doc, I cannot take that chance in my life. Well, can't get it, right? Yeah. yeah. The, the problem with glycerol, back to the bug thing, glycerol is made, it's essentially, right, it's antifreeze. And if you put it in your car in a, in a fix, you'll be able to drive across Alaska on the ice. I'm not joking, somebody did. But the point is, it's always available sitting in the lab as a reagent. What gets everybody all excited is a company called Ephthalgan used to put it in a nice little package and it was a small amount. It had the little punctured top that everybody likes and it looked cool. The problem is you could drop, you could pee and poop in that jar and those bugs would be dead in about five minutes. It just will not support bacterial or parasitic or viral life. It's that kind of hygroscopic solution. It just kills them. So I, I just tell the lab, send me up five in a bottle. They have it. They just, like this place, I'm very clear because I've had the discussion with them, they just don't want to do that. Right. And I tell them, great, if they don't want the business, fine with me, yeah. take them somewhere else. Yeah. Somebody will. Okay, so individualized by the surgeon, so you got to go with what your surgeon is good is, what the literature says applies to a group, right? That's the problem with percentages. If 90% get better, I have no clue right now that you're in the 90 or the 10 group. Now, those who've been to the office know that we're doing the five modality testing, and meaning that we ask the nerve to do all five of its functions. We ask it to do differentiate cold, thermal perception, vibration, light touch, pressure, and vibration. And the point is we're trying to find out which of the modalities that damage, and we now, and we're, we're trying to get this published, we're pretty sure if three or more modalities are involved, that MBD takes a hit by about 10 to 15 percentage points because MBD is predicated on if I move the vessel, the nerve will heal. Well, if the nerve's damaged enough that it can't do that, then you can't pretend to the patient they're going to be in the 90 group. So, but some people say, that's okay. I still like to go there. I'm fine with it. Because they're doing it open-ended, plus they get to see whether the data is correct or not. But we are very sure that if you are very sensitive to vibration, you should never, ever, ever get a balloon drives those people crazy. They try to strangle the doctor afterwards. And I, we have no clue, except that it's a different fiber, we're going after a whole different pain system, why that is. And it's gonna take a while to get it. And the key is that there's a range, sometimes quite wide, wide in success, because some people come at one year, some people come at 10 years, some people come with lots and lots of pain cells, some, I'm sorry, a few pain cells, come, some come with a lot. Some come with this juicy vessel sitting right there saying, take me, like a high school girl. And others are like, <laughs> Watch it, watch it. You're on camera, Dan. Yeah, yeah. My wife's gonna call again anyway. Yeah. <laughs> She's gonna yeah, ask, which high school girl? <laughs> okay, just have a look at what you're getting into, percutaneous approaches. And one of the reasons we wrote the book is, this is your ability to say to the doctor, are you gonna do it this way? What's in the book is the way all surgeons who do this regularly agree it should be done. Meaning, face gets prepped, not your whole face. You go to sleep in some centers or heavily sedated. We like you to sleep because I figured, who with face pain likes to have a big old needle stuck in your face? Let's take a vote. Anybody? Mm -hmm. What a surprise. Nobody. So I put folks to sleep. So you go to sleep thinking, who's that ugly dude in the mask? You wake up thinking, oh, it's him and a Band-Aid. But I don't need you during the surgery in all honesty because I'm gonna put the glycerol in. I'm not gonna ask you is that enough. It's not gonna do anything for the next six to 12 hours. 
So I just put you to sleep. Same for the balloon. I thought there was one of them that they woke you up in the middle of it. Yeah. Maybe that was just the... No, radio frequency, they used to. Used to. The problem is, who's cooked the steak out? Mm. So you're cooking your steak. Right. You cut it, and it's a little bit gray and pink and a little bit gray. And then in my case, you go in the house and refill your wine glass, you come out and it's black. Mm. Radio frequency has the same problem because we don't know how injured the nerve is. All the data to no surprise is on normal nerves. Mm -hmm. That if I apply such and such a heat for such and such a period of time to such and such a size nerve, I should get this amount of change. Well, that's great for a normal nerve with normal myelin. But we already said we have data to suggest that your myelin is not normal. It's this myelin. It's not making mm -hmm. those little swirls it's supposed to properly. So how much heat's gonna knock it off? So most of us say, go light, and somewhat ruthlessly say to the patient, I can wake you up. If you tell me 24 hours later I still have pain, let's put you back to sleep. Do it again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's that simple. Because here's the important step. You need to make sure that your surgeon is always proof that they're in the right spot. There's four little holes under there where we're going on the brainstem. One lets this branch three out. The one higher up lets branch two out. The other two let a vein and an artery out. Well, those aren't the holes to stick. And if you get too rigorous, sticking them right behind it is old Mr. Brain. And people have stuck the needle right into the brain. So no surprise, A, the face pain didn't go away, and in one case, the patient did. So I'm not mm -hmm. suggesting that these have a high mortality rate by any means, but you got to do it properly. Mm -hmm. And what happens most of the time is folks can't get into that little hole. About 1% <coughs> of the time, there really is and this skull, this is an actual human skull, you'll be able to see that the hole is blocked by a bone. Now, if you're starting out in the beginning, a junior resident or younger faculty, and you're poking and you feel bone, you're not going to say, well, what the hell, you just go through. But over the years, you might get the sense of, okay, that's that little bone, I can just crack it and slide past. But even then, about 1% to 2% of the time, I can't get in. So we just don't. Don't you think it's logical, though, that a neurosurgeon would become more comfortable with one of those rather than, rather than all five? Just Well, but that would be like saying, I'm only going to do frontal brain tumors. Because the front of the brain and the cerebellum are two entirely different places to work. Yeah. Or I'm only going to do aneurysms in the front as opposed to the back. So, yes, you could decide, I don't like the risk of the others, I'm just not going to do it. I'm okay with that. Mm -hmm. I understand your point about knowing how to do all five, and then you can give a balanced perspective to the patient. No question about that. But yeah. I think you can give pros and cons without actually doing it, though, right? Sure. Yeah. But if you okay. haven't done it, you don't have your own pros and yeah. cons. Yeah. You're borrowing John's pros and Out cons book. or Book's pros and cons, yeah. and that's great. Okay. Unless in your hands. What if the patient says, geez, I really like that radio frequency, and your last one was six, seven years yeah. ago when you were in residency, and you don't really, what do you now yeah. say? Well, you know. Yeah. I just don't want the, the newer members to get the feeling that if they don't do all five, that's the wrong neurosurgery. Oh, okay. you know, I yeah. agree. If that was yeah. the message, no, I just meant... No, you didn't. I just want our perspective, yeah. Okay, so with glycerol, you're bathing the nerve. That is, you're basically just getting the needle next to the nerve and leaving the solution. And there's a technical aspect to seeing what's called the cave of Mechel. That's where that little PBX box sits. You're trying to drown the box. With radio frequency, like I said, you're trying to cook the box. Box is the same place. With balloon, you're basically trying to squeeze the box. This one's different. The first two are trying to hit pain fibers that respond to pin or light touch that's uncomfortable. This one says, in chronic pain, a group of fibers that spend most of their life doing what are called mechanical responses, meaning they get you to move away and they start to initiate that chain. They've now jumped into being pain. And they, they use something called NMDA receptors, which is why some of the drugs are now aimed at that group. But it's a different group. We don't knock off the little fibers, and we think that's kind of cool. And the we here is Jeff Brown, another one of your MAB members. Jeff trained with Sean Mullen. Sean had the idea with a different balloon of doing this. Jeff, and then he was kind enough to involve some dumb Irishman. We tried to measure how high pressure could we get away with without hurting the nerve and how long should we keep the pressure up, basically building a force curve for the engineers in the room. And it took about two, three years and a hell of a lot of pigs, but they were tasty. And we just did it and finally got the handle on. But it was those pigs that allowed us to see that, that we were picking off another branch altogether.
And in radio surgery, you nuke the nerve. Radio surgery being the gamma knife. Gamma knife. There we go. A picture Sorry. of the previous gamma knife, but the one that's in most wide use around the world is this particular model. For those who don't know how the gamma knife works, there's cobalt, same cobalt you get for breast cancer, lung cancer, everything. They're sitting 201 pieces of cobalt are sitting behind little lead shields. All of them aim at one one millimeter point. Depending on how much you want to give, you tell the machine open 50 shields, 100 shields, 200 shields, whatever. And it'll simply open for a period of time, letting a certain amount of cobalt in from all those different directions. Meaning, you don't get the radiation burn that a breast cancer patient might get because you're firing the whole beam right into the breast. You're getting it all around the head. You can't hit the eye, however. You always carve out, see how no beams transect the eye, because you don't want to go through the eye. The eye is incredibly sensitive, the globe and the nerve right behind it, to radiation which is why you get blind from things like lasers and so on. And then the MBD, you saw a picture of it earlier. There's our friend the nerve, a little bit of felt in an artery. This is PJ's picture. Now, what if you don't have this? What if you never had, never had trigeminal artery, but you had post-injury, traumatic pain, or we, the surgeon, gave it to you by trying to treat you? So do we treat the nerve or the pain system? And we think that that's the way to go. More cortex stimulation is essentially back to what I said. You can't tickle yourself. But if somebody else can tickle you, you're, you're still ticklish. So why can't you tickle yourself? We're pretty sure with functional MRI, but we made this theory, or I, a bunch of us made it about six, seven years ago. Your brain sees your hand heading to the ticklish spot. Mm -hmm. in, the, in other words, the motor system sees it. So it tells the sensory system Yo, that's us. Don't get excited. <laughs> nothing bad's going to happen. And so no matter how long you keep screwing around, nothing happens. But you could have your hand down. If somebody sneaks their finger underneath and tickles you, you'll be ticklish, right? But if you push your hand while they do that, and then they try, they can't because you just told the sensory system about the motor system. So those two talk. So originally motor cortex was that you put the lead only over the motor cortex. Kind of odd think, well, sensory, I should go over the sensory cortex. But it didn't work. So Tsubakawa, the surgeon in Japan now, some 31 years ago, said, hmm, if I put this other place. We've taken it a step further and tried to always put one lead over the sensory and three over the motor cortex. And when you say, well, where do you put this? You're in the head, and everybody's built like this, meaning as we're going along the surface of the brain, we can stimulate, usually we start out here, and we can make your finger jump, and then your thumb, and then your eyelid twitch. And when we know the thumb and the eyelid are twitching, we know, hey, we're home. Where we're going to be for the motor. And then you lay your electrode this way. You try and get it. You don't want to get your tongue jumping unless, you know, if the six-year-old kid, then he has an excuse in class. The teacher says, he's always sticking his tongue out. Yeah, it's his machine. Don't worry about it. And you don't want it too low. People have put it here where people get coughing. And we use this post-stroke. Someone has a weak leg, for example, we can put it up here, and we've gotten some very nice results. Jeff Brown did it while I was here, and we followed his lead by stimulating acute strokes and getting motor back much, much earlier, easily two standard deviations sooner than would be expected with the normal stroke pattern, but just independent of age, but also motor that nobody thought. I have a guy who had a ruptured aneurysm from cocaine use, so the medical system, of course, was like, well, you know, he deserved it. Kind of thing, but he came to me four years after he was hemiplegic. Hmm. Put the stimulator in. Within six months, he moved his hand, and then his wife would be the first to tell you. Within eight months, he got her pregnant. Hmm. Never been able to do that before. So now, you know, he's saying to me, "Don't move the electrode. I like it right where it is." <laughs> Maybe I need an electrode. Probably three or four. <laughs> Not for my TN. At seventy-one, three or yeah. four. Maybe. Yeah. Uh, Can you use that for other types of pain besides yeah. facial? Well, let's just say we use it for stroke pain. We've been using it for stroke. We've been using it in traumatic pain, in other words, trauma to the brain surface. We've started to use it for folks who have what are called chronic fatigue syndrome pain and are looking at that. Those are, again, numbers that are sitting at the 150, 200 range. Motor cortex is at about the worldwide, probably around the 30,000 range. In the U.S., it sits 
probably no more than about 2800 at the current time. Why? The government won't pay for it. The insurance companies just don't want anything to do with the device. And what about back pain? Yeah, it's being used for back pain, it's being used for diabetic foot pain, it's being used mm -hmm. for people who have the dyspareunia, it's being used for people who have pelvic pain syndromes. Again, we have two members, Aaron, Aaron Running and uh, Meredith, don't you have one? Are those your Our real new names? member. Are those your real names or he's using a fake name? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Protecting the innocent. We have a new member with us, we'll talk to her afterward, if you can All stay. Right, so to keep moving along, deep brain stimulation, I showed why that coming back right now, the federal government basically forbids it. It means Medicare won't pay for it, which means only insurance companies say, great, we don't have to either. Um, for those who are interested in either one of these two, I would like you to humbly walk away using the same technique we used for the deep brain stimulator. I used to do an operation called pallidotomy for tremor and Parkinson's to improve the patient's functional quality. We had like several hundred of them. They worked very well. Well, Medtronic came along and said, huh, maybe we can make electrode and instead of destroying tissue and then finding out that the focus moved two, three millimeters here, we'll put the stimulator in, you turn it on, turn it off, reprogram it, work great. Of course, insurance companies are like, no, thank you. Pallidotomy cost them somewhere in the neighborhood of four or five thousand dollars. This is 18,000 for the machine. So they said, not, not happening. Once we finished the trial in Philadelphia, Philadelphia, for those who remember, is somewhat of a litigious, politically oriented town. We said to the patients, go to your politicians, go to your state senators, go to your US senator, and just say, I want this. So we had a petition from 400 Parkinson's patients who had tremor and bradykinesia that stooped walk signed and then the politicians came to the insurance commission and ultimately to the insurance company saying, data looks pretty good. And it took about two years and now it's paid for. This is going the same way. This has been around, as I said, 32 years. Because they say, oh, it's experimental. How long do we have to go for it to be experimental? A couple of generations, let me break. It's the same as MVD. The reason they can't stop us doing MVDs and they tried to stop PG at the beginning is there's no equipment. How's that girl doing out in Southern California that you did it <coughs> during our uh, 2008 yeah. conference? Say she's well. We she's well right? yeah. Yeah. All right, peripheral stimulation is gaining some traction. Conrad Slavin, one of the people in your uh, previous stimulators, didn't work for a couple of mechanical reasons, hard to get to the same place. They're a little bulky. Patients didn't like the cosmetic effect. He's working with a German company. It's a razor thin wire that looks like it'll sit quite nicely in the location that you're after. Uh, but instead of it having a device that's implanted, because young women don't like the idea of having a third breast sitting way up here above their bras, like, hey, hey, no thanks. <laughs> we, we colored it with one girl, and she didn't like that at all. But she asked for it. In any case, this is, is a remote control. The device, the stimulation is occurring in the device in your hand, and you just point it, and it'll radio frequency speak to the electrode and make it work. Germans are waiting for final approval to bring it out electrically, it works fine, doesn't break. It should be a home run if we can get it positioned properly. When did you put that? In the U.S.? You'll be dead, buried, your kids will be dead. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm serious. My daughter lives in Berlin, I'm going. The I'm FDA going. won't even let us start what's called a phase one trial on animals. Oh, oh gosh. So no we said, well. No one's in pain in the FDA, huh? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, they're in a lot of pain. Need to be pain. Yeah, lasers always gets asked. Absolutely no data. Those guys on the radio here, the you know blast yeah. pain people. Yeah, I have to admit I took exception with them because the ads were a little bit annoying. So I said, guys, data. Well, our, you know our patients say they're better. Christ, you know I can get my kids to say they're better because they're afraid dad'll hit them. Are they actually better? They, there is no data. There are studies done specifically on face pain. There are now studies underway again. Low level laser doesn't seem to work. We thought ours did. We did a study at Pittsburgh. We thought, oh, hey, this looks like it works. Didn't pan out. Several other major studies with about two, 3,000 patients say, nah, not really. There's a new study going where the laser gets applied in what's called a dialable laser, up and down energy at the time. Interesting concept. It's sort of like the magnetic applications we'll talk about in a second. Maybe it'll pan out. I don't know. But right now, the guy in uh, North Carolina who's advertising, mm -hmm. I'll fix you, yeah. is 
very curious. You have to pay up front. Insurance won't cover it. You have to pay for 10 sessions. Even the chiropractors realized they couldn't cut, get away with that crap anymore. So, and I, again, I wrote them and said, any data, we're happy to get you in a forum. We'll put you at one of the national meetings. We'll let you talk to people. Because I didn't believe in chiropractic. I started by thinking, oh, please, a load of hooey, twisting the necks to make them better. So as P PJs want to do, we got the government to give us a grant. We pa paired up with the uh, National Life Institute in Atlanta, a well-known chiropractic center. We did what's called a phase one study, paroxysmal type one pain. Damn, it worked. 60% of the patients reported relief for greater than three weeks. Did they have to repeat it? Sure. But who takes pain meds or, or Tegretol or carbamate? How many times a day? A lot. Yeah, so we thought, gee, every three or four weeks is still a home run. Hell of a lot cheaper, no side effect. So it works. And I know you've had Jamie and, and uh, some of the NUCA people, and to their credit, it really does work. Not on everybody, but they don't say it works on everybody. So I, I, I use myself as an example because I started out saying, crap. And the data says, nope. So I like that. I like when the data proves us to be wrong. This is the newest area. This is, again, something I'm very annoyed with the government. How many people have heard about the magnetic stimulation for depression? And by the way, just now was released for obesity, the North Star machine. Well, the target that we want, remember that homunculus I showed you with the face and the arm? Our target is four millimeters in front of where their target is, meaning all you'd have to do is slide in the seat. Just slide. <laughs> I like that theory. And they won't let us do it. We asked the North Star people, could we buy their machine? We, we decided to screw them and trying to do a research project. And we just said, how about we buy one? They're $28,000. I said, we'll buy it. We'll run our studies. Nope. The FDA forbids them to sell it to anybody but a psychiatrist for the only use of depression. Mm -hmm. Now, in Europe, where this idiocy doesn't exist, and in Israel, they're using repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation for tinnitus, face pain, stroke pain, and other types of pain. Great success. So you, they're now pairing it with a functional MRI to decide whether they want to hit a surface target or a deeper target. And again, just today, uh, no, yesterday, paper published where they're using it to go all the way down in epilepsy to our friend the amygdala and the temporal lobe where epilepsy in many cases originates and stopping it. No incision. You can see a six-year-old mom, uh, I'm sorry, a mom of a six-year-old who says, let's see. He wants to open side of the skull, take out a chunk of my son's brain, root around in there. He wants to put a magnet. Let me go with this magnet guy for a while, see if that works out. Works. The Swiss have, in some cases, with high flux magnet, which we don't have in this country yet, cured epilepsy. So it's pretty cool. So this works. That isn't what um, you're doing with the um, lady up and the thumb right here. Um, what's your name? Was here last it's time. Marian? Yeah, Marion. Doesn't relate no, to that at all. No, no. it's okay. the more mindfulness stuff. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So and then, can you say, tell them you had depression and have them use it on you to see if it would help for your face pain? No. First of all, if you tell them, I mean, you're going to have to say I'm depressed. They're going to say why, and then you're going to say I have face pain, which, by the way, and this may be semantics on my part. Sure. If your kid died, you'd cry probably, right? I mean, the right kid. There's one that maybe you'd want to get, <laughs> right? Yeah. That's not depression. That's grief. So if you have pain, it won't go away, and the doctors aren't quite sure to do with it, myself included, who doesn't have grief over that? So that's not depression. Depression is a chemical, a very specific chemical process for which we cannot find an extra stimulus in which there's a very clear, easy to measure shift in brain chemistry and the Prozacs and all the things work eh, sort of well. You try doing that with people with face pain, nothing happens. You do it with bad back pain, nothing happens. People who are amputated, post-traumatic syndrome, the soldiers we're working with, nothing happens. Success rates are miserable. And then what's called compliance, meaning continue to use it miserably. Because it's the wrong drug for the wrong thing. And I'm not the only one saying it. I know you're thinking, why this guy's off the off his nut? But that's the point. Once they thought that you were there and they and you didn't get like a Beck depression scale or some scale and their whole thing and you locked in. The other is that the target's different. 
they're going to shoot at the depression target, not the face paint target, because they'd have to do functional MRI to make sure they're on the right target. Can they measure depression, the chemical portion of it, with well, blood? It, no, but it, with bold oxygen uh, level dependency MRI, you can see areas that react in depression. Oh, with an MRI, not a yeah. blood. No, okay. but they, they've tagged with a spec scan, it's called, which is a nuclear medicine scan. Yeah. You tag the chemical, and then you look to see how what's its rate of appearance in certain areas of the brain. And that the data is eight years old. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Pretty good data. Behind my reading. <laughs> that is sort of admittedly at the other end, but has the same idea is the dres or the nucleus caudalis. We open the back of your head, go into your spine and spinal cord, right where the nucleus is, and we lightly burn it. What I find very annoying with the federal government, both have a success rate of about 60%, both have a durability, that is motor cortex and DREZ, a durability of about six years. Motor cortex has to be reprogrammed. DREZ, obviously, is a one-time deal. This, on average, costs about $32,000, and about 20% of patients have to go to rehab because the coordination fibers are sitting right over where we're working. And almost everybody says, yeah, I see what you mean. My hand's just not quite the same, and you go to rehab and you get better, which adds about 18, 20,000. So total 52,000 or thereabouts. This costs, on average, about 22,000 up front, and they won't approve it. But, and I've done this several times in the office, Blue Cross in particular, patient will be failed a bunch of other things, so I'll say, I'll call them, say, can I pre-cert for an MCS? They'll say, no. <coughs> I'm not doing it. So then I'll hang up, I'll call back. Uh, here's a patient, here's a story. Can I get pre certain for a dress? Well, yeah, sure. Those operations both came out in the exact same year. One came out in North Carolina, one came out in Japan. This one is actually done less in the United States. Right now, as far as we can tell, because we just talked, there are nine of us that do it it's not a fun place to be and it's kind of easy to screw the patient up. That's right, I thought there's a big downside to that. There can be, yeah, but, but, they, but they'll approve it. So to me, very pound foolish. I can't even say penny wise because there was no wise anywhere in there. It was just stupid. And I've said that to them and of course they feel that I'm questioning their abilities, which I am, but it's me. Okay, motor cortex, what's the data? Neuropathic face pain, 50% reported relief all the way up to 72 months. Remember, just so that you get this, we put the, the electrode in, we bring it out to a little box, and for the next three days, we every two hours, at least in our unit, we change the positive, the, what's called the polarity. You saw the lead with all the little... Oops, sorry. All these little contact points. We don't use the polar one anymore. And so we can make one positive, one negative little combinations until we figure out who under there likes this. That's the skew code I talked about earlier. And we also find out which ones didn't they like so that we know not to program into those later. But that means nobody gets the generator. This thing, which is exactly what the pacemaker hooked up to wires until they've passed what's called trial. But of that group, at 72 months, how long? Six years. 50% still say, thanks, appreciate it. A pretty good number for a $22,000 investment. This machine, people say, well, it could break, this and that. That is the pacemaker that Medtronic has made for over 40 years. As you might guess, they're pretty careful about the device failure because here, if the device fails, yeah, who cares? They get some pain for a couple of days, we can yeah. fix it. Pacemaker stops working, that's a big deal. Patient drops dead, family's pissed, electronic doesn't look good. So their pacemakers just don't, and that's all it is. That's their basic pacemaker battery. It's a mm -hmm. little bit of a change, a little more programming for us, but that's the device. This is the same wire components that they slide into the heart which are designed with all your head twisting and so on, not to break, not to twist, not to bend, mm -hmm. and rarely does. So it's a pretty solid mechanical device. So DBS, where we're trying to target, as I said earlier, in deep brain, we're trying to go after the suffering component of the pain matrix, 
which is specifically the posterior tunnel and the anterior edge of the insula. And it won't be a test on that later. But right now, while the safety and efficacy of the equipment is proven, the electrodes, trying to nail them into the places, is a little problematic because we don't have very good intraoperative functional MRIs. So at least what we're doing is we look at the insula, we do some measurements on it, then we go in and simply duplicate the measurements and drop our electrode at what we call one standard deviation offside our measurements, figuring if we turn up the current enough, we should be able to reach out. If you think about it, if you have two leads and you turn on the current, positive to negative, it makes a little sphere of current. How we turn it up allows that sphere to change sides. So we think that that may get us there. But once again, the Federal Dummies Association doesn't go for it. So DBS or PNT, 14% when started out, 60% durable success. Who's got the best success right now? Folks at Calgary. They've been doing pretty steadily for the last 10 years. They have somewhere in the neighborhood of DBS for face pain in particular, somewhere in the neighborhood of about 120 patients. Very good track record, very good group, good targeting, nicely done. So um, for those who know how the system works, if you're in someone's emergency room and you get admitted, you can't get denied. So I always tell patients, if you want DBS, take a trip to Calgary, trip, when the DR is saying your face hurts like hell, get admitted, tell the guys up there, Rafi's his name. Uh, yeah, I'm Casey's patient in the States. And see if you can talk them into a DBS. Because then your insurance company is screwed, they have to pay. And yes, I'd say that on the record, because they've heard me say it. Like I said to the insurance company, you want to be stupid? I can outdo you. But I tell them, why not approve something? Because if they don't, the patient will show up in the emergency room, it's 1500 bucks just to walk through the door in the emergency room between the lab work and all that mm -hmm. crap. And then you get admitted anyway, which is what I was trying to do along. And then you get the procedure anyway. So what we do is add money. So I don't like dummies. But then they don't like me either. So peripheral nerve, increasing number of articles, all are case series. In other words, there's no large MVD experience. Dr. Virtual, who uh, Tim mentioned earlier, has about a 50% pain relief, 80% however reports satisfaction, which Kim thinks is an important part because as I said earlier, these are patients who rank in the lowest satisfaction scales of any chronic pain group. So if you can make more life more bearable, why not? Especially if you're outside the brain. Once you're inside, I think you gotta work to a little higher standard, but on the surface, why not? Infection rate quite low. Dr. Slavin, who I mentioned with the previous device that was available, 68% relief, 18% some mechanical failure with the device. It moved, it wouldn't stay in place. The skin got too stimulated, all things that they're trying to deal with with this next iteration coming out. And here's what happens. I mean, you can do them. I tend to do them when I did. I don't, don't do that many because I'm not comfortable with the current device. As you go from behind the hairline and slide it down in the case of V1, V2 pain. If it's V3 pain, you come behind the ear and slide it forward. And then you have to hook it up to the battery like we saw with the DBS. But that's essentially what happens. So for everybody in the room, you fill your forehead. Ain't that much skin there. You gain 100 pounds, same amount of skin. So yes, you can feel the electrode. And all too frequently, you can see the electrode. On the other hand, you can always say, I just was at the Klingon Festival, and I'm on my way home. Because <laughs> that's exactly what you look like. Well, what if it's here? You can see it. Yeah, the problem is for us to be in the layer where the nerve is, it's going to be always visible in the current iteration. But it was really just taking a DBS electrode and moving it to the face. The company in Germany now realizes you need a much, much smaller electrode that will carry the same current. So they're using... For those that are interested in this, a platinum iridium wire that's 50 microns thick, twisted. Remember the old uh, tire ad, seven times two times one? Talks about the wire to carry current. So does that show? Hmm? Does that show the familiar wire? I haven't seen a patient with it. They say no. And the, the group that's over there is a pretty reliable group. Who knows it? 
the group that's doing it is in Erlangen. And I think they've just gotten the Hanover group to come with them. Those are two of the big neuroscience centers. But I think the Hanover group was having trouble with their IRB. Institutionally retarded board members. That's what that stands for. Okay, recent developments. Oh, we just talked about this last night. Very interesting that it looks, how many people when they have their face pain, it also feels like the back of their head hurts or that they touch the back of their head and they can set off their face pain. Anybody? Yeah, so it's a fairly common thing, and, and there's question whether that's the migraine or whether that's simply scalp nerves, of which the occipital is one of them. So there is a study just completed in which four people with classic face pain, type 2, they got an occipital nerve stimulator and nothing done to the face pain nerve. And they seem to be reporting relief. Now the problem is it's a small number, so there's a placebo effect. It's also that they may be more satisfied that they feel better because after all stimulation is stimulation. Just the same as if you slam your thumb in a drawer at home and you squeeze it, it feels better. So it's going to take a few more patients to delve that out. But the point is that people are going in this direction. Once again, our friends in the insurance company are totally against this. They've denied every single case so far. All across the board, Aetna, Cigna, Blue Cross, they all are like, no, 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 no. not going to win. Mainly because they're afraid that every headache on the planet is going to get treated with one of these. But that's important because headaches occur in 80% of the population at least once, like back pain, but in 40% chronically. 318 million people with chronic headaches and they're popping pills and they're taking crap so we're thinking okay when 18,000 and it works what the hell that same area in the brain stem do the dress by the group in Turkey to say through the bones in your neck which belongs there, that's the nerve. Electrode in, stick it. nucleus that we're currently to reduce the pain. Interesting concept. They've done a couple. Uh, they didn't give me and then I talked about repetitive Blood 
do it. It's called mono. Like, oh God, how did it happen? She said, but she takes no medicine. She's got nothing wrong with her. We tested her from stem to stern. We spent probably more money than we should. I said, how do you think the hell she got to be 90? She's one sturdy old bird. We'll probably have to try to kill her to get to hurt her with the operation. Did the operation, night of surgery. I'm making post-op rounds in the ICU that some people here are familiar with. I'm going home. He said, well, Grandma, here's how it works. You got paid for the bed. I'm going home, sonny. Get me a cab. I said, well, here, here's the deal. If you can get your family to take you home tonight, the night you had brain surgery at 90, you can go. Your family says, you can't go. You owe me a plate of cookies when you show up in the office. <laughs> family, of course, is like, go away, and they left. Next morning, I come in, 5 o'clock for our usual morning rounds. Those who've been with me know we get more. And she's dressed, sitting in a chair, the little purse with the cane handle, <laughs> the pill box hat. Sonny, I'm getting a cab. And she left. Nurses said, you have paperwork to sign. Let him sign it. <laughs> <laughs> she's been fine ever since. <clears throat> <coughs> so the, the message really is anesthesia with the hearts realize that age shouldn't be the barrier because they, they almost used to say you can't get your heart done cabbage until you know coronary artery bypass graft if you're over 60 and it was over 70 and it was over 75 and it was 80. At the University oh. of Pennsylvania I was the critical care guy for the heart unit with Paul Marino. We did around 800 hearts a year. I mean we, we took care of them post -op. The lowest mortality group was the 80 to 100 group, and they had 250 patients in it. Because in Philadelphia, all those people have cash. Yeah. And the hospital was not turning away a cash customer. Especially, you know, they'd say grandma's 82, but she's the family doyen, she runs the show, she's the, the Philadelphia matriarch, and grandma gets what grandma wants. And then we looked at the numbers and we're like, bitch, these people are doing better than the 30-year-olds. Well, it makes sense. If we're cracking their chest at 30, probably not the world's best organ in there. So, thanks for taking your time. Appreciate you spending it with me. And if you have questions, I'm happy to try to answer them. But more importantly, help your board, your MAB, and your BOD by letting us know what we need to do better sooner and how we can better serve you in the support groups. Tim knows that that, that for me is a big deal, that the support groups is how we got to where we are in 25 years. They're not getting the recognition I think they should be getting in the last couple of years. And that comes from the constituency. This is just like Congress. You guys run the show. You tell the BOD what to do. And Tim and Lynn are your spokespersons to get that message home. And the people on the other end that they're talking to really do want to hear it. Cindy Azell, Ron Irons, they want to hear about problems. They want to try and fix it. We're going to fix everything? Hell no. We're going to leave that to the Republicans. <laughs> I'm saying to ISIS, God, just wait about a year and you can have the place for free. It'll be a wreck. Mm. <laughs> you won't even have to blow anything up. Mm. Thank you so much. A question. Um, <laughs> has nothing to do with facial pain, but I have chronic back pain and I cannot find a chronic back pain support. I don't think there is one, in no. honesty. There used to be a whole list of yeah. uh, support groups here at Beaumont. and. In the last five years, I have not, in fact, I've talked to PR, and it used to be able to call the operator, and they would say, here are the support groups. In fact, I helped start one, and most of the people in it had RSD and some lower back pain, and I helped them kick it off. This was 15 years ago, maybe, and um, it's just disappeared. You know what? What's the reason for, I mean, so many It takes somebody to spend yeah. volunteer Those time, two. yeah. Those yeah. two who run this yeah. for you keep it going. Yeah. Otherwise, in the face pain, we'd be the same way. We, if we yeah. don't get new support group leaders, who's going to run these groups? We're What's trying to Skype to places that we can't always get to. We have a clinic now in Kabul, and I went once or twice. My wife was panic-stricken, but now we Skype clinic. Doc examines them, I watch, we chit-chat, mm -hmm. he prescribes. Mm -hmm.
Some of this is, is applicable to her lower back, though, right? This, some of the stimulator yeah, you all, talked about. All, yeah. all the brain stuff is, motor cortex is currently being used for back pain. Um, you know, like every test, you have to decide on the data we have, does this person make a 100% fit, 50% fit? Because after 50%, now we're sort of taking advantage of it. I, I tell a story, and some people have heard it. You come in with bad face pain, and I say, look, one of the operations is cut off your head, stitch it in the middle of your back. You're thinking, you know, I saw those shirts in Land's End. I'm going to have my husband go buy a couple, because you'll do anything. And, and we know that. The re responsibility of the surgeon is to say, we know we can basically talk you into anything, especially if we catch you right during an attack. That's not fair. You have the discussion ahead of time. You decide, we're only two and a half. And then the next time the pain comes, maybe that'll be enough to make your decision. But it should occur that way, not that you're in and you're saying, I don't care what you do, do something. No. In fact, those who've been through it with me know that if you come in in acute pain and we haven't had the discussion, I'll get you, I'll admit you, I'll give you pain medicines, I'll keep you overnight till we break the attack. I won't even let you have surgery on that visit, no matter what you tell me. Because I think that's the pain talking to me, not the patient in pain. And that's a big deal, because a couple months later, they may think, God damn it, why did I do that? I don't want that. That's do you do a lower back at all? Yeah. You do? <clears throat> oh, OK. We do the surgery, sure. Oh, OK. You're not just neck up. No. Anywhere in, OK. That's good to know. Can I ask a question? Yes, ma'am. Um, when you talked about chronic mm -hmm. pain. One sec. For those who their faces come to the limit, or their butt has come to the limit, if you get up and leave, I will not be offended. I know you had a schedule and I probably took too much of your time. So no. if you really have to go, feel free. We're here Man. as long as anybody sorry, wants to be. Um, for chronic pain patients, sleep is very important. What would you say is the amount of time needed for to help you feel better? Like, no, Is it more for right somebody there. in pain? No, seven, seven and a half. Okay. Pretty much everybody agrees. That, that, and the key is not the time. It's a risk of being crude. It's sort of like sex. When's it really good and when's it kind of just going through the motions? So there's two or three phases to sleep. The deep REM sleep is actually useless, but people spend more time in it. The rest of sleep, which is the one level up, is actually the reparative phase of sleep. This is in all the sleep literature. So the problem with drugs is that they could push you right into the REM state, certain drugs. So companies, the, the new hot thing in the market is how can my drug work? It's called sleep induction and sleep maintenance. How can I get them to fall asleep and get into their own rhythm instead of me forcing them? And we have a lot of experience with this in the hospital. For those who've been in, know, you know, the nurses figure it's always daytime, right? No disrespect, but lights are on all day, phones are ringing all day, pagers are going off. Who can sleep? I have trouble sleeping there, and I'm drinking when I'm staying in the night. So then what kind of medication do you suggest? We currently have felt that the data for ambient CR, but this is not this is not a recommendation of, you know, for a patient that I haven't seen. But ambient CR seems that the company got it right. Instead of having this big wallop, they've got this nice graded release. That's the CR control release. It seems to be having the largest number of people say, yeah, I'm not waking up from over. I'm not waking up 42 times a night with, you know, that kind of stuff, which is all non-restful sleep. And I'm not a sleep expert, so if, if you're looking into that, you should find, and there are people here who are sleep experts at Beaumont, and of course all around town. St. John's has one good one, as I recall. Okay. Ma'am. Oh, can I look at oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, 50 cents? What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> Dollar? <laughs> sorry. Um, the pain cells that you talk about that we make, the pain cells, what what are they made of? I mean, what? Same cells as others. It, it's just, you got a bunch of cells. Remember, you have upwards, when you're born, unless you're Irish, of about 10 billion brain cells. As far as we can tell, most people are using 5 to 7 percent. And huge swaths of them are just sitting there with no assignment. And the reason we're pretty sure of that is when somebody has a stroke and they kill a big group of cells, and then you meet them a year later, and there they are. Walking. Well, those cells didn't come back to life. That's not the Lazarus effect. The guys that weren't assigned got forced into it, and that's what PT does. It's a repetitive 
Okay, let's get the boys to help out. Let's get the <coughs> sensation back. Similarly in pain, there appears to be throughout the system a series of cells that are just sitting there with no defined function until they get stimulated. And that's the point. They can go both ways. In animals, at least, they can make the animal more resistant to the same degree of current. If we just keep sneaking it up little by little, what current made the animal lift his paw off before, now it doesn't. So it goes, these cells go both ways. We, it, they're basically what they're called as pluripotential, meaning they've got all of the things that the pain system cells can do, good and bad. Okay. And Liz found, however, that it's the bad ones that occur with the chronic stimulus because they're protected. They're all getting ganging up saying, oh my God, something really bad is happening. And she's not moving away from it. So we got to do something about this. I mean, how many people have been in other types of pain where you tried to ignore it and then finally your back, your knee just said, really? Watch this. <laughs> and down you went or you had to sit down. That's the system saying, I'll get her attention. Well, yeah, I'll just keep plugging away. But that's no different than, and the reason I, it's important is you're at the airport, you got two bags, you're running to catch the plane. Of course, your plane's at gate one and you just entered in the middle of Detroit, so it's the run. You run along and then almost unconsciously you set the bags down, don't you, and switch hands or whatever. Because the tendons and the pain system said, I'm close to breaking here, dude. But you never had that thought. You just thought, I gotta stop a minute. But there was nothing wrong with your arms, and there is nothing wrong. That pain system is now trying to protect you. But when it goes out of control, then it lets you do less and less. In other words, your physiologic envelope, the day that you're trying to spend, becomes more and more narrow. That's the classic pain story. I used to be able to do this, now I can only do this. I used to be able to, and then it gets worse and worse and worse. That's the only reason we can get away with even talking about surgery is this physiologic cycle doesn't seem to try to self-correct. Other questions? Ma'am, you did. Well, I'm sure you can't say 100%, but if you get the MVD for the TN, are you off medication or really? The 88 percent refers to pain-free off medications with type one classic pain. Type two, 65 to 70 percent pain-free off medications. Except, as the young lady said earlier, see now you're young. <laughs> what I call the talisman pill. You know, they, they come to me. All right, so I'm still going to get it back over here, but. They'll come on 10 a day of Tegretol, and then I'll tell them post-op, okay, you can start going down. We have a physiolo or what's called a pharmacologic profile, how long till the cell levels drop. But I'll call a couple weeks later, email, and they'll say, well, you know, I didn't make that last downward bump. Why not? Well, you know, I'm feeling pretty good, but... And to me, the minute they say the butt with that little stretch, that's their insula speaking. He's talking to me right through the phone saying, I am afraid, and I'm not going off this regimen. Yes, uh -huh. right. So... But pain-free off-medication is the goal. PJ used to just, Dr. Jenna, used to just slash it day one. Didn't give him a choice. The patient was too goofy. Nurses had him basically under their thumb. They couldn't get the pills that they wanted to. We didn't have, he also didn't make a lot of post-op rounds. So those of us who were getting stabbed, yelled at, screamed at, and so on realized, okay, this is not the way we're going to be able to do this. So some of the guys trained at Pittsburgh will be on a two-week taper automatic. And then I'm trying to say to more and more, go physiologic. You know, you know what the, what, what's called the elimination halftime of the drug. So 10 pills gives you this amount. Okay, at such and such a time, you should be at the new pill level. They're still center okay. So it could, some patients take eight, 10 weeks because they came in on a car load of drugs and some come in on two pills a day and they're off by the end of the second week. Recovery time from that surgery? Roughly See, this is a big deal with brain surgery. We're not doing anything, in a sense. You wake up in the operating room, at least with us, and I say, stick out your tongue, wiggle your feet, and then I whisper in the ear on the affected side and make sure you can follow the command. That's your brain working. There's no healing for it to do. So your neck has to heal, but that's like having a cut on your arm that you got to the emergency room, they threw some stitches in. So yes, we give you pain pills, we send you home with them. But you're out of bed the day of surgery now in almost all the places that do MBD. And more and more of the surgeons, like when we, when I first went to PJ, people stayed an average of seven to ten days. That was the old days when the hospital thought you were a human being. You got admitted the night before, somebody actually made a mistake <laughs> talking to you, trying to comfort your feet.
fear, eh, that's all. The insurance company doesn't like that crap. So now you show up hoping you don't get a flat, hoping you get through pre up on time, hoping the snow is, you know, it's great. But I always tell the anesthesia guys, you've got to be pissed off about this. Because they're driving down the highway thinking, am I going to make it? Am I going to make it? It's nuts. But the point is, that you get it. We get you out of bed that afternoon. And there, and the girls left, but uh, patients aren't particularly thrilled with that idea. But like I tell them, we're not running a democracy. It's a monarchy, post up, and I'm the king. I know that getting you up into a chair, this position, your body says, hey, not dead. This, your body says, I'm dead. Okay. We, and peeing. Nobody likes to pee in those bedpans. So we teach you to walk into the john. We put, we put all in the ICU at South Shore when we redesigned it, all bathrooms are 10 and a half feet from the bed. So I, I'm not tolerating an excuse of, mm, the bathroom's too far away. <laughs> Yeah, and you're going to pee in your hand, honey, because I am you're either getting in the bed, the nurses are told, no bedpans, not allowed. Sometimes I have a nurse on each side to get me in there, that's what it takes to get out of this room. Yeah, yeah. 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 Is this the lift with brain MVG or is that about three or four hours? There's no difference in the sense that Dr. Chahanian on the West Coast said, oh, I do totally endoscopic. What you were looking at was the same opening he uses. The, lay, the endoscope can't penetrate the bone magically. You've got to make a hole. Right, right. Well, we know from all endoscopic surgery, belly and elsewhere, that there's an error rate. The least error rate is when you're looking and the instrument's coming in the same plane because your judgment of distance is better. By the time the angle gets to 15 degrees, your error rate goes up to 32%. That hole is just a little bit larger than my thumb. Which means I mean, that the angle to the distance gets you eight degrees. The error rate is 45% in all labs. So we're concerned that people who are starting out on their learning curve, if the scope did the operation better, no problem. But the error rate is very high. Shahanian, for example, knocks off right around 20% of some nerve. Because I've operated on a bunch of these patients. They're still in face pain and they're deaf. So we started, we did about 300 cases with the scope where what happened is either I would start the case or PJ. So one of us, the other ones would come in and say, okay, I think it's these vessels. We'd leave, having written that on a piece of paper, a nurse would take it, surgeon would do the case, the scope would go in at the beginning and the end saying that I get all the vessels. And then we looked at, did the scope change anything? Did another vessel get decompressed and more felt be put in? Less than a half percent of <coughs> So we offer it to patients. If I need to see something, I would use it. But Tim told you here the number does make a difference. We've been doing them long enough. That that's a microscope. You saw the tilt where we could see the nerves down below. That was a regular old microscope. I think the vast majority of neurosurgeons doing MBD right now do them the standard open way because you have what's called a confocal microscope that gives you your absolute best depth penetration. And the eighth nerve is seven to eight millimeters closer to you than the fifth nerve. You do not want to go past it with a scope and not be able to see it, and then bang it. Just bang some of them once, patient was dead. So we haven't seen the value to it. It's a gimmick, but if you talk to the laparoscopic cholecystectomy people, they're slowly coming around to admit their numbers look better when they did the standard small open. It's going to take a while, but if you just looked in the last couple of months in the paper, government studies have looked, individual institutions have looked and said, on average, cases take longer, blood loss is slightly higher, success rate is about the same, but in someone with a learning curve under three years, success rate is not the same, open is better than not discovered. So, okay, so that, so then, but basically the recovery time, like she was asking, is the Both same. the same. Same. Yeah. Got to make a hole work. Yeah. You mentioned um, sciatica, carpal tunnel, PN, and I don't know, I'm, I'm adding my brain to this. Those are pre genetic predispositions that... that yeah, what, what the pain study showed is we took the DNA of a bunch of folks, first with face pain, then with diabetic foot pain, and others on the little portion of the chromosome that codes for pain. There appears to be some if everybody's aware of it, there's little amino acid sequences that predict things. There appears to be common grouping in patients who have more pain than others. Because I have all those. 
which is why that's, you know, most of these studies, you got to come up with a good reason to do it. That's what was happening. We're sitting in the office seeing some of these people two, three years later, and they're saying, my ah, face paint's better, but you don't know how many handles, and well, I got it on the other side. And so it's genetic, so it's not necessarily your, your, um, your nerves are saying your or blood vessels. I mean, your blood vessels are, no, the, are the blood, being, it's just blood vessels are sagging, mm -hmm. catching a nerve that has genetically incomplete myelin. And so I'm talking about on all those conditions. Yeah. Oh, and all the other conditions. Yeah. No, in carpal it, tunnel, for example, it looks like it's a straightforward compression syndrome. In chronic pelvic pain, which they're just now, the key is you got to take pieces of the nerve. Patients are a little, you know. Hey, when I'm in there, can I take a chunk of your nerve? No, Doc. Leave all the pieces in there, please. Are you saying is the myelin I'm in the rest of your nerve, body bad? I'm, I'm asking if it's the nerve versus the vessel. Hmm. Both. There's pulsatility to which the nerve is overly susceptible because it's still only 23 per 100,000. What we know on posts, or if we just, like we did a study for our hypertension because we've been able to cure hypertension with this operation, we could show that non-hypertensives had vessels in the exact same place at about a 15 to 20 percent rate versus 80 percent for the hypertensives. But they didn't have hypertension. Yeah. So there must be some, and we now have a book coming out in the fall in which we try to explain it. And I write to see how many people around the world go, Jesus Christ, he's been at the liquor again. Not even close. And then I just say, well, you know, not a bad idea. And can you, thanks for mentioning it, can you ever um, consider putting your books, like publishing so we can go right online? Like, I want to read all, I want to read everything that's on your book. I don't want to just read what these well, will publish. Remember, that's not our choice, the company. I know, but why can't we, why can't we screw the company and just go right to the publisher? Because they won't publish. Well, you got to make money. go directly gotta make online. Yeah. Self-publishing. Yeah. For self-publishing, unless you're... Why can't, why can't we do Amazon? We don't want it, why can't we... No, you still have to get the book. And self-publishing means, like, the chapters I told you about all over the room, I have to write them. And I have to make sure that I stay in the correct voice. In other words, otherwise the reader's like, yeah. you're jumping back and forth, driving crazy. Or, and this is very important, the striking back, the first time George said we'll aim for fourth grade. No argument, that was what the New York Times was doing. This group has gotten much, much better. So we went for fifth grade the second time. We are now in a debate, do we go to the seventh grade with this book? So we have an editor who that's all she's doing, is looking at the literary content so that we, well, we don't want to leave well, people behind. Why can't we have a medical level book as well? Well, yeah, there are those. That we have a book. PJ is the main author, it's not that thick. It's a tome written basically for other doctors. I wrote about the history of it in 458, previously totally unknown to the world, an Iranian described this. But we found an old Iranian who translated the old language from, the, from what's called the canon of Avicenna and reported that. And then the book goes on. To, we talk about the operation. Jeff wrote a chapter. And Kim wrote a chapter. And so that book for medical professionals is out there. Johanna wrote a book for medical what, what professionals. Is that? Johanna's is the pathophysiology of TN and Johanna Zachary <coughs> used to be on your board. Right. She's an English lady, a delightful woman. You don't want to argue with her though if you like to have your <laughs> skin <laughs> stay on. She plays you a lot. <laughs> but a very good researcher, not a surgeon. So she's always helpful to say you surgeons don't know what you're doing. Double blind, double blind, double blind. Yeah. Yeah. yeah she keeps one eye closed, I keep both eyes open. But yeah. the, she's written a very, very nice book, getting a very nice collection. But those are medical. Level. Just so I finish. This edition of the Striking Back, assuming that we don't, it, it's going to be an e-book. Great. And we're looking, mm -hmm. and that's part of what we're doing. We're going to abstract about 30% or so of the content, because you can't have a 500-page e-book. That, you know, the, that just doesn't work for most people's computers. They can't download that large a packet. Yeah. So we're looking, we're trying to find out from the different computer sites, okay, what's the average packet size we can download across the anticipated they spectrum. They've got the Bible on there. Huh? They've got the Bible on there. They can handle your, yeah. your, uh, your big book. Not really. That's what they told us. Not, not, not without rearranging the book. The Bible gets rearranged. So do, do, so do it in the uh, Old Testament. Well, I said we're going to do a book, and we're going to do about
about that percent and try and make sure we have enough that somebody would read it and say, okay, good, it's sort of like tonight. Yeah. I hope I gave you a taste of a couple of different areas. Obviously, none of them were complete. And if you were interested in a specific area, you would then go find some of the literature I referred to right. or the book and, and get better at it. Same thing. Mm -hmm. But awesome. we're trying to do that, but he made the point. The publisher who does the actual setting and the font and stuff, he doesn't make any money if you put it online unless he charges you for each copy online. Now we've got to set up a mechanism for that to work. Not all publishers do that. For example, he works at Barnes & Noble. He sends 1,000 copies out every month. We've sold about 132,000 copies, he said, worldwide. But those are getting shipped to China and shipped to India and stuff. How's he going to get paid? I mean, he's got to set up a very complicated arrangement. And a lot of publishers are that way. I, I have other books. We have yeah. a book on the history of the Nobel Prize winners. It was the same fight. And I don't begrudge them that. They're making a living. Yeah, right. Sometimes, and like in this case, they gave us the copy editor for free. It's normally a $25,000 item. Which is going to go through all those words I just told you about. He yeah. gave it to us. We, we got her for one year for free. The regular editor, the, he didn't spell that right. That's not a sentence, you idiot. Oh, that footnote isn't even close to right. That lady is costing us 32000 a year, or costing your organization 32000 a year. Worth every penny. Hmm? Worth every penny. We thought so, and so the board, the MAB recommended to the BOD that we'd agree that a regular editor, George, was the editor last time, because that's right. what he did for his newspaper. Right. But as George said, it consumed almost six, eight months of his entire year the first time, and that wasn't even done, and then a good five months, the second his wife sort of said, uh, remember me? I'm the other one in the bed. So he didn't want to be involved this time around. I mean, in the sense of this work, he's right. giving us excellent viewpoints in that, that all important, I've been there, right. done that, done that again. He's had three recurrences. He's perfect for the people. We don't want just all the successes. We want to be able to tell people, okay, you had it, didn't work. Is that the end of the world? Are you shot? No. You saw it. We're trying to make move on, but yeah. even within the MVD, yeah. maybe we need to redo it. Well, it it's interesting. They were, somebody said they just noticed that I was on the... Say goodnight, Harold. Good night. This guy's not got pass. He's a Wayne State. If he was in Oakland, he'd have hair. Yeah. <laughs> You know, you're talking about the myelin sheath. If the myelin sheath is bad, I know it's a dumb question, but if the myelin sheath is genetically bad in the in the head, is it in my foot as well? Yes. That nerve? So it's consistent throughout the body. We think so. And that's why that's what the point you were making. Yeah. yeah we think so. Why why one person has a lot of pain conditions and another person gets to a hundred and hasn't had one. Yeah. If you Yeah. Yep. That would work, yeah. And would a person like that have a characteristic of excess scar tissue forming with trauma? Don't, don't know that yet. But the normal nerve, this is the nerve. The myelin looks like a clamshell. So we have we have about seventy nerves. When I was at the resident at the University of Pittsburgh, night for surgery, we find the shoes. We go in and talk to the patient about the risks and we get them to sign the consent for the surgery. Then we would ask them if we could have their nerve when they're dead. Separate consent. So when they pass away, we could take the nerve. I'd say at least 20% of the time people say to me, hey, what doc, how about I sign that post-op? Because I don't want to sign that pre-op because then you're in there and you're rooting around and you figure, what the hell, let's take the nerve, we're here. And they'd say that over and over again. So apparently they all talk to themselves before <laughs> But the point was that when we took these out, we found that even in people who said they were better, that they were pain-free, in some case, one patient in that in love series, Seth Love series, pathology series, was 15 years out. And those looked like hell. Of course, we don't know how bad it looked before the surgery, but it didn't look very good. So it was around that time, PJ, is, uh, Dr. Penn is sticking with, it's the vessel, it's the vessel, it's the vessel. Okay, he invented it, it you know, he's entitled, and he's brilliant. But he hires people that ask questions, and I said, okay, it's the vessel, but how come the nerve doesn't look better? So there's got to be something else. So we looked at 
nerve counts. There's 187,000 fibers in the human nerve. We think about 30,000 get involved for pain to occur where it can't be self-regulated. But we think that if you get a few of those better, or as I mentioned to one young lady, if you look at the nerve like you saw in the picture, and you separate the fascicles, the ability of the nerve to short circuit, it's a current, it's very limited. We can measure the distance it'll go. So Sindo said, gee, if I take that same instrument you saw, the one I said was two and a half millimeters around the nerve, and just open these fascicles up, physically separate them. So you're looking down and now they look like free nerves for people who either had no vessel or you thought, nah, it's not the world's best vessel. And then thinking, oh, what it is, now thinking, okay, but that vessel's enough to tip them over. Or this is your third time in, and it's scarred to beat credit the band. And you, you figure the scar is holding the nerve together. We know cutting it, big mistake. Alcohol into it, big mistake. So we're back to combing it. But it's dysmyelin. This myelin did not form properly. It's myelin. Take it out, look at it, a little piece. It's myelin. It's got all the components, sphingo myelin and fat and all that. So even, even these little kids that get TM at two or whatever, they get dysmyelin. <coughs> we think so. Yeah. Again, mom said, no, you can't have a piece of my kid's nerve. Sure. You know, once we get the moms over this normal hangout, fine, kids will laugh. Tegretol on me, I get a hundred times worse pain yeah, um, shooting up my teeth, and then so they decided, well, you must not have a, a yeah, that's vein a or artery, thing, right? Yeah. Okay, so the old thing was that the pain had to be shooting, it had to be either in V2 or V3, rarely in V1, right. it had to respond to Tegretol, it had to be short. So yeah. this was the doctor. We started seeing a lot of people in Pittsburgh who said, you know, my first pain was really burning, very first pain. Or they would say, as Tim alluded to, I had the sharp shooting pain for about a year, and you know, I'm, I don't have any teeth on this side, and then this happened. But now it's sharp and burning. So Kim Virtual, a fellow we mentioned earlier, showed that that's probably the natural progression of a dysmyelinated nerve undergoing chronic constant tension and the way we think it works is all nerves in all people at all times. If you bend your elbow 50 times, you stretch these fibers a little bit. But most people repair at the average rate of repair time-wise. And then there's some people, and you all know about them because they make the press, they were, quote, paralyzed and they walked, their arm didn't work at all and it got better because they're fast healers. We think that you folks are here. You're not off the curve. You don't have a disease, yeah. but your nerve is a slow healer. Unfortunately, the vessel's always there. So if it hurts, a big bad bolt of pain, you get the first time that settles down, that's because the repair system kicked in plus your antinociceptive system. But meanwhile, the vessel keeps pounding away on this slow repair. And sure enough, people tell us, big bad bout of pain, better, big bad bout of pain, better. The chronic story is big bad bout of pain, not completely better, big bad bout of pain. And then they start to come closer and closer and closer, and then the burning starts. And so we think it's just a steady accumulation of damage in a slow healer. The problem was, where did the words come from? That's what the gene study was for. Well, then why, does, why would Tegretol make it worse? It's just, Tegretol, unfortunately, that's why I said we chemically interrogate the nerve. You're doing something specifically for the nerve. You're changing the way <coughs> it manipulates sodium. When the nerve fires, sodium moves from one place to another, chloride moves back, and an electrical event occurs. Screw that up, and the nerve doesn't fire. And anybody, take a perfectly normal person, overfeed them water so you dilute them. Nerves don't fire, they're listless, they get sleepy, they can't think. I mean, it's real. It's hyponatremia, it happens a lot. About usually 30% of people in an ICU in any hospital in the country get hyponatremia. So, point is, it's, it's not abnormal. But here, if the nerve was holding on as best it could and the descending antinociceptive system was keeping up and now you just screwed with it, all hell will break loose. So a long time ago, we said, if you respond to Tegretol, 
you probably will respond to operative better. How do we find that out? By reverse collection of data. We looked at the successors, and we went back and said, okay, what predicted the 90% success rate? Short paroxysmal pain, response to Tegretol. But that didn't mean that if you didn't respond to Tegretol, nobody got better from the operation. A bunch did. So PJ easily, 20, 25 years ago, started saying to people, yeah, yeah, had a good mind. <coughs> it does not exclude the diagnosis. It helps you tell the patient where to go, and it helps you tell your neurologist where to go. But the point is, it, it, it's not a yes or no, and shouldn't be. It, it, that's a disservice. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you may metabolize it differently than somebody who's not as sensitive. Yeah, well, it, like with that. Plus, if I gave, like, you, do you have TNC? Do you have any? Who, me? Face pain, yeah. Uh, okay, so if I give him too much Tegretol, well, it's all over. I was, I was at 200 milligrams, yeah. but it, it wasn't helping. So I, she told me to go to 300. So I take a pill and a half uh, three times a day. But I have people on 2,500. If I suddenly told you tonight, take 2,500, uh, give me a call tomorrow, I won't hear from them for a couple of days. And then I'll hear I took, from the hospital saying, God, it was bad. I took 100 milligrams twice a day, and my pain just went just crazy. And it was supposed to help. But why does when yeah. the touching set it off? Because the nerve doesn't like it. It didn't like the Tegretol. It may not like the normal. But you're talking about mainly typical or classic, I don't no, want TN1 I'm there, right? I'm talking about back pain. I'm talking about diabetic foot pain. I'm talking about all sorts of these neuropathic pain. If we start saying the medicine makes the diagnosis, we yeah, know no, that, that completely ignores the fact that she has one color hair and she has another, right. and that's not the same size, and he's a he's a guy. What I want to get at is where we my comment about if you have myelin bad in one part of the body, you're probably going to have it in the other. If you have a car accident or have three years of infection like I had, that doesn't mean that your myelin's bad. You had a one incident yeah, you may have had a that caused that and, I, and I'm afraid Donna knowing a lot about hers because she's seen my pain specialist falls into that category it was more of a dental issue well, and therefore because the theory we've been hearing for 20 years is Tegretol is a diagnostic tool yeah. for classic trigeminal neuralgia it's not. now you're saying yeah you're going against that but I haven't heard that come out of TNA yes, sir. other than you saying well, no, it the now other, only MAB says that MAB says it, but us shrinks down here at the lower level haven't heard it. I don't know. Have you seen well, it? I haven't heard that. I haven't heard that. Yeah. You would need to get their communication out here. No, I've said it to the phone camps, which is the support group leader said, just tell the patients, it's not, your neurologist shouldn't get away with, okay, you don't have it, get out. It's, okay, it's not neurologists, it's neurosurgeons, it's all of them. Well, neurosurgeons, yeah. remember, I told you that group is shrinking. Anything to get them out the door. For the neurosurgeon, if you're yeah. a non-responder, you're not right. as good an operative candidate. Right, okay. So he or she okay. may decide, I'm not yeah. taking a chance. That's right. why so she shouldn't have an MVD. Yeah. Like you're telling he's her. Saying. He's saying the opposite. Right? Okay, and you're pretending that people don't pad their stats? Oh, I know. I'm just thinking. like they put, okay. Yeah. <laughs> back pain, being, yeah. there's back right. surgeries being done for no obvious reason. 80% of all of them in the United States in the last two years have been judged. Unnecessary. Unnecessary, right. yeah. Not that. So but how, how they do you still treat, are doing the same rate, nobody stopped them. How do you treat a nerve that might have been damaged by oral surgery? No, oh, remember the trigeminal neuropathic pain back in the slides? That's that group. So there are some, the NMDA receptors, the ketamine family, the, some of the central procedures, they're all saying, yep, this is pain, but it's not due to a vessel. So screwing around with a vessel isn't going to get a signal. So and damaging the nerve more than get a say we're cutting the nerve than get a say so let's go to something else and you start by trying to ask the nerve what exactly happened since you don't want to take a piece out because you're using it we chemically interrogate it give Tegretol you say go worse you say great so the channel agents don't seem to work you give something called verapamil that's a calcium channel agent you say go worse okay great we know that calcium channel agent doesn't work then we have different agents of different types. Lidocaine is a different sodium chloride agent. Epicrinic acid, also a, a, a medicine to make you pee, only does the chloride, doesn't screw with the sodium. So we can literally work our way through this little mm -hmm. algorithm. So medication-wise is what you're saying? 
that's to ask what's going on. Oh. Mm -hmm. Patients usually say, yeah, but uh, I don't want to really spend the rest of my life going, yeah. do I have my pills? Exactly. Or is the doctor going to prescribe me this time? Or is he going to blow me off? Or is he going to get some letter from the government? Right. This state That's did and said, what I'm afraid of. Give him narcotics and you lose your license and go to jail. Now, Tim knows I don't like narcotics, mm. but I also think taking the doctors out of the equation and letting a bunch of idiots in Lansing make the decision is even worse. Mm -hmm. Christ, they can't fix the road. How can they take care of patients? So uh, you chemically interrogate, and then you start to build what you know about the nerve. And as you can see, I hope from the slide, we've spent a lot of time the last five, seven years yeah. saying, how do these nerves actually work? The old theory of fires, pain, just isn't right. There's too many modifiers in there. Right. We need to figure out what's wrong with these folks, not meaning is there anything wrong with yours. What is the imbalance? What is the physiologic disturbance and where is it? Mm -hmm. For a surgeon, we're all about targets. If you want the surgeon to do something, have to have a target. target yeah. Medicine doesn't need a target. Take a pill, mm -hmm. goes everywhere. That's the good and the bad. For us, we gotta be, you can't just say to the patient, ah, eh, take off the top of your head, like George here, and I'll just look around. Mm -hmm. You're asleep, I find nothing. Thanks for keeping, to ask, keeping the question from that you question your body of work and rethink it, think you think. Might have to. He didn't send you everybody don't down. To, you, you don't have to care as much as you do, and you do, and we're so grateful. All right. I'm just saying, we don't have a blueprint. The fun is trying to find a blueprint. So every time you get a little something in this pain matrix, we're really excited about that. Yeah. The fact that we can yeah. see the insula. Yeah. I'm hoping before I quit, when my wife mm -hmm. shoots me, which probably the latter is sooner, mm -hmm. that we'll be able to put a strip electrode right on the insula. We'll be able to do it right through a teeny little drill hole slide the electrode down and sit it right on the insula and have the patient say, no, not careful. Yeah. And guess who's funding us? Or we think is going to fund us? The Army. Mm -hmm. Because a soldier yeah. may not yeah. be afraid. Yeah. Yeah. It's a bad concept in my opinion because I'm a soldier mm -hmm. and you mm -hmm. do not want your troopers not to be fearful of things like mm -hmm. when we jump out of the aircraft at 28,000. Mm -hmm. You should be peeing your pants. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's dark. You have no idea if the guy on the ground has the right reading. So you should be a little afraid, but they're saying, oh, you know, we can make this super warrior. Yeah, well, we're also, you know, there's, there are also so much danger. I'm sure you, I can't imagine what you see. you got a lot so of candidates for these wars. You're dead is, you won't know. Yeah. It's not like you're dead and you say to yourself, damn, I'm dead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know? But you, I can't imagine what you see, though. You're just remarkable. No, 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 it's just. How many, are we replacing enough neurosurgeons like yourself that are, interested in, de I could ask that about any mm -hmm. any specialty that are willing to deal with mm -hmm. facial pain, any no. type pain because it's tough. Yeah. We've already so I worry our gen well, next generation. No, it's, just, it's two reasons and it's not to discredit the guys. Yeah. Every time we go to CME there's always this question at the end, what's the barrier to take care of your patients? Mm -hmm. And it'll say you know, lack of evidence and so on and so forth. And then there's our old friend Insurance. Yeah. How many people in the room have had to fight with their insurance company to get yeah. the most routine thing? Yeah. Nobody? You guys didn't have to fight? Private yeah. pay. 30, uh, our, um, yeah. okay, but it, to, to us, the insurance months. arena now looks like an adversarial arena. Right. We propose, and remember, we're the ones that did 10, 12 years of training, been in practice now, coming on 30 years, and mm. they say, no. And say, and your background is, I'm a clerk. Yeah. They said, cluck, did you say? No, cluck. <laughs> cluck. And then they get angry. But then you're talking to the nurse, and you'd say, I'm sorry, you, you're a pain trained nurse. You did, no, I work in insurance company. Then why the hell are you telling me what to do? And the Obamacare isn't going to help that? No. The Affordable Care Act? Well, the whole thing is about saving money. You know that. Yeah. yeah. Well, these are expensive. Time you keep the cost. This, that's why I said, you're a minority. Right. You're going for 100000 for this particular one. No more than about, the estimate is no more than probably about 150 to 175,000 per 175, 1,750 per 100,000 or in chronic pain. So 315 million, you could do the numbers. You're still too small. You're not like the cancer group. You're not like the yeah. HIV group yeah. was. Yeah. So you're not commanding any lobby. And you know, to the insurance so companies and the drug companies, yeah. you don't look like a target. They yeah. can't make enough money off it. 
So I know you'd like the books to be free and online, but... No, I don't want them to be free. I don't expect them to be free. Oh, no, but I meant I that the point is that everybody who's in this game is trying to make cash off Yeah, of no, of course. No, I don't want it to be free. I want to read. I just want... I want to read what you... We want information. Yeah. And, and try to get it, but the point with, with pain in answer to his question is, a lot of guys are coming out saying, do I need that headache? And let's be fair, the next generation, if any of you have started to see them, it's nine to five. It's yeah. a five job, mm -hmm. and so and so takes over. Yeah. That's how that's my fear emergency. for our kids. Yeah, I did yeah. a case the other day that you see mm -hmm. about one every ten years, and a resident left at five o'clock right on time. I said, you know, you may never see one of these again. I said, this guy got sent to me from Peru. Yeah. 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 Well, I gotta go. It's five o'clock. Got to go. Pick it up. Outrageous. No. It, it, remember, this came from your nice federal government. We have data. And not just neurosurgery, general surgery too, that shows that the graduating chief residents have done 25 to 27 percent fewer cases, and they have seen, on average, 15 to 20 percent less patients. Our business is not built on tests. It's built on how much pain today, and what's the progression, or how much weakness today, and where did it go, or how much back and leg pain, and did therapy help? It's all built on following the story. But if you're following this part, and then at 5 o'clock, he's following this part, and she's following the weekend that part, and then the nurse is following this part, you've all been to an office where that's happened to you. Who's got the story? So I'm not saying that we're that smart. I, you know, when I was in residency, and it's not to say, oh, I walked uphill to school and walked uphill home, but we were on call every other night for five years in the house. But I did 7,000 general surgery cases in four years. So somebody came with a gunshot wound to the chest at DRH one night, and Hannah's ledger was very, very well trained, trauma surgeon, said, I'll get the next one, you get this one, because it was one rolling in right behind it. It's DRH. You know, we get gunshot wounds all the time. But she said, you go take it. And I'm not even on a general surgery service. But she said, you know, you won't get yourself into trouble. Just get the bleeding stopped. Because yeah. I got trained by a guy who said, don't take a thousand pictures. Put an X on the holes, make a bigger hole right under each hole, and see what you find. Some stuff you can fix, some you can't. If you can't, remember, you're not the one doing the dying. They are. <laughs> you didn't shoot them. You didn't shoot them, yeah. yeah. So I know that sounds ruthless, but... Uh, anti-seizure meds, I was told you should have no business seeing a neurosurgeon. There, there are people who believe that, and there are neurosurgeons who will see you on that basis. Mm -hmm. So but, is that false then? Well, it is insofar as who do you think of the entire medical profession is the most likely to have the most detailed knowledge of the central nervous system where the pain system is, both anatomically, structurally, and by touching it. Which group? Neurologists, anesthesiologists, or us? Neurosurgeons. So, as he said, you got to decide, do I operate on everybody who rolls in the front door? Well, some back surgeons in this town do. And that's all they want to do. Mm. I don't. That's why I'm an academician. If I don't operate, I still take care of you and I still get a check. And that's not how I worked it out. It's just I don't want that pressure of didn't do enough cases this month, gotta do another one. It is like borderline. Right. I always tell the residents every day, you can do the case tomorrow. You cannot fix the case you screwed up yesterday. So You're working out of Beaumont now too, huh? The well, the new on. medical school? I yeah, saw we, something no, on I'm your on the faculty of the medical school okay. for PM&R, not in our surgery. Oh, PM&R, that's right. But okay. I'll be at uh, Gross Point one whenever they finish mm -hmm. pulling around the paperwork. So is that, you'll be <coughs> that, you're going to be in practice with somebody else too or no? Does anybody know John Zinkel? Great guy. Mm -hmm. John's been alone for about 20 years. I'm just going to spell him. I mean, we'll effectively cover each other because our mindsets are fairly similar. Mm -hmm. When in doubt, don't. Is Try Dr. To get your Clancy patient better. also joining you? Who? Dr. Clancy? No, it's just good. John doesn't really want a partner per se, but he would mm -hmm. like to take a break and not think he'll be dead when I come back. Yeah. Will you be in Gross Point then, you think? Rather than down, down rather than South Shore? I think everything will be a transition. I, there okay. are the South Shore patients who I've been seeing for five oh, or six okay. years in the trauma business. So I don't want to just suddenly say, hey, y'all right. have to drive. Right. So I'll probably transition to two offices over period, but we will open an office either in Beaumont, Ghost Point itself, because they're building offices, or at John's office. Um, 
uh, I wanted to tell you that the reason you didn't hear any clapping at the end of Dr. Casey's presentation is that we had to delete some of the items that were of a personal nature. So uh, there was tremendous round of applause for uh, Dr. Casey going two hours and 40 minutes, a little over that even, uh, imparting uh, the knowledge uh, relative to trigeminal neuralgia that only he can impart. So uh, we were very pleased and there was a, a great round of applause. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed uh, Dr. Casey's presentation. Tim Guth here. Thank you.